people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed. Allow me to just simply pause there. But verse 14 of 2 Timothy 3, the word continue. Uh, this is one of those present progressive tenses in the Greek language. Continue now and continue to do this thing or these things for the rest of your lives. And so it's that command as we understand the original. It is, it is a present progressive. Uh, it's, the, it's the same tense as when Christ on the cross uh, looked to those who had gathered and looked to the heavens and said, to tell us die. It is finished now and continues to be finished. It's the same tense. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. It puts in your mind Deuteronomy 6, doesn't it? Verses uh, 4 through 9, the, the Shema, as they would know that. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And these things that I command you today shall be in your hearts. And we also learn from Proverbs to train up a child in the way that they should go. Even when they are old, they will not depart from it. And allow me to read verse 15 again. And how from childhood you have learned and you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Shall we pray? <clears throat> and Father, we've gathered together today as your people. We've come to worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, we know that you are light, and in you there is no darkness at all, as we have heard this morning, the reading of 1 John, as we have sung to you, as we have prayed to you, as we have called upon you in this hour, we pray that you would continue to meet us where we are. That, Father, the cares of this world would be removed from our hearts and our minds, even if just for a little while, that we would fully focus on you, that we, as the old hymn says, would look full in your wonderful face. Father, we also quote the old hymn that by your spirit that you would descend upon our hearts, wean them from earth, through all their pulses move, stoop to our weakness, mighty as you are, and make us to love you as we ought to love you. In Christ's name. And Father, may the words that I say this morning, may you use them to further your kingdom here on this earth. Father, we have it gathered to hear the ramblings of a man's mind. But Father, we've come with Bibles open and hearts ready to receive what you would have us to learn for your glory. And we give this time to you in Christ's name. Amen. Turn over with me again to Exodus chapter 20. Believe it or not, we've spent now uh, the, uh, all of last Sunday and the beginning of this sermon uh, speaking of the doctrine of creation, and we haven't even made it to Genesis 1 yet. And so we're getting there, uh, but I want to lay again this foundation, again, not to uh, say this in such a way that would seek to insult your ability to remember what was said last week. That's, that's not why, but it's, it's that constant reminder, it's that constant encouragement that thus saith the Lord is the foundation. And I know that for those of us who are grounded in the Reformed faith, those of us who spend the time with those outside of the world and with family, we know that this is what we believe. But there is such a tendency within culture that the Bible may just work for you. Uh, Christianity is, is maybe something that, that you're involved in, and, that, and that's good for you. You should have some kind of a moral compass. But it has nothing to do with me, and the answer is yes, it does, because we are made in his image. We belong to him, whether you want to believe that or not. And so it's this understanding that everything he says and he does, everything he has taught us according to his word, is true. And that's why we use 2 Timothy 3 
16 and 17. Because this is him speaking to us. You know, we often hear the or read the cartoons or, or, or the jokes of, I wish the Lord would tell me what to do. And you see the cartoon of a hand handing the Bible through the clouds. I have already done that. Here it is. Read my word. Take it and read it. I'm reminded of, uh, it was St. Augustine, if I've shared this with you, for, for, forgive a repeat, but at his conversion, when you read, uh, I believe it's book nine of his confessions. If you've never read the confessions of St. Augustine, please do that. Um, but as he's there in book nine, at the moment that it's fixing to happen, his conversion, he finds himself in a park weeping with, he says, with great sorrow and pathos, questioning everything. Lord, well, what am I doing? Why am I so miserable and all this? And he's weeping and, and through the tears, he, he says in his confessions, I wasn't sure if it was just a popular children's saying or if it was a new game that they were playing, but there was singing happening somewhere around the corner. And I'm paraphrasing what he says. And they were saying in Latin, toile lege, toile lege. Then they would laugh and giggle and run around and say it again, toile lege, take it, read it. That's how it translates. And it, in the providence of God, <laughs> moved him in his life to go home and begin to read the word of God. His mother had been praying for his conversion since his birth. If you know anything about Augustine before his conversion, we're all sinners in need of a savior. Certainly he was also in that. And he, and he goes and he, and he reads and he goes down and the first lady that he speaks to is his mother. And she begins to weep and they begin to embrace and with the, with the glory and the mercy and grace of God, he becomes one of the fathers of Christendom. The, the pr promotion and the progression of how we understand the, the cores of doctrines of theology. And you could go through all of these who would, who would have been used of the Lord to get us to where we are now. But, but the point is, it has always been grounded in thus saith the Lord. I know that you're going through a class where you're studying the five solas of the Reformation. Uh, sola Scriptura and Sola Fide were Thursday night, correct? And so you understand all of these doctrines, again, grounded in thus saith the Lord, for the glory of God alone, by his grace alone, through Christ alone, uh, through faith alone. Uh, and, and, and we understand all of these to, un to, to ultimately point us back to the fact that it is the Word of God. It was Dr. Luther at the Diet of Worms in 1521 when, when the Catholic Church came calling and, and basically said, you, you need to recant or you need to get out or we're going to do something about it. And he looks at them and says, to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand. And it wasn't just him speaking of the room of where he was in. I stand on the promises. I stand on the promises of the word of God. I've given you these uh, last week, but I want to repeat them just in case I went too fast. John 17, 17. Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. And it's interesting how two chapters later, when Jesus is before Pilate, or excuse me, a chapter later, and it's Pilate who's really trying to figure out what's going on because he really could have cared less about either party. And here's Jesus standing before him. And he asks the question because he's trying to figure out whether the mob is correct or whether this Messiah, they claim to be the Messiah, is correct. And he says, what is truth? I've heard a preacher say he asked the wrong question because truth was standing right in front of his face. And he didn't know it. You could also reference Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. Titus chapter 1, the author we know to be uh, from 2 Timothy 3, 16. It is God breathed. So Titus chapter 1 teaches us, I believe it's verse 2 or verse 3, who cannot lie. Hebrews chapter 4, Isaiah chapter 55. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It will not return unto me empty. It has a purpose. The, the ministry of the word has a purpose. And it's not just to direct our doctrine, but
but it's that doctrine that dances. It, it's that doctrine that really hits the mark within the life of those that you would witness that too, because we know it is true. And that was basically the outline of last Sunday. And I told you last week that I want to give you five pillars of what we believe the creation account to be and how we believe it came about and more specifically the time in which these things happen. And so the first thing that I want to say is the foundation for any doctrine of our faith, not just here at Pathway Presbyterian Church, but within Vanguard Presbyterian, this is one of the this is one of the number one pillars that makes Vanguard Presbyterian is that we believe in a 624 hour day view of creation. Because we believe that's what the Bible clearly teaches. And so when we understand that foundational layer to be those verses that, that I gave you, uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, John 17, 17, Psalm 119, 105. Titus 1, Hebrews 4, Isaiah 55. It could go on and on and on because the Bible is so beautifully interwoven. It's that scarlet thread all throughout the Old and the New Testaments that we understand this truth to constantly take place, to constantly show us and to constantly encourage us. We know that in an ever-changing world, we have an unchanged truth. And it is the Word of God. So that foundation point number one or pillar number one you could even outline it like you were building a house and we know it's upon the rock it's upon the rock of the word so from that first layer the second layer then now finally after about an hour and a half or hour and 15 minutes total of, of introduction time turn to genesis chapter one i'm so excited to do this so that we can go through uh, these, these pillars of the faith, these layers of the house of a 624-hour day view. Now, I want us to look at, and it's, uh, it's not too difficult to see within the English Bible, but when you understand the entirety of chapter 1, there is what is known in Hebrew as the we're going to have a Hebrew lesson this morning, okay? And you're, and you're going to ace it. So it's, it's known as the wall. You could spell that in English, W-A-W. -W, or you could also say Vav, V-A-V. The Vav consecutive. That's the law within Hebrew. Now, this is, this is East Tennessean pronunciation of Hebrew, okay? But <laughs> Vav or wall. So this is Tennessee and Hebrew 101. All right? And what we understand... From the entire chapter of Genesis 1 is that it is one sentence. Now, I understand in English we have to have separations of nouns and verbs and adjectives and adverbs and conjunctions, and we need to separate that out. And yes, and the English Bible does that so that it's easier to read. We later on, or earlier in church history, we, we separated it. And uh, for purposes of reference, for purposes of memorization, chapter numbers and verses came in. So we understand that when you look at the original documents that we have of the word, that there are no spaces, there were no vowels in the Hebrew. And so you can see how these men uh, really, really had to knew, know the, uh, the original languages. <clears throat> And so those things came in later in church history. But what I want to say in this, in this chapter, Moses is very, very careful to record. This is one sentence. And so when we look at, for example, allow me to interject vav, which is the word for and, by the way, in the Hebrew. It's a conjunction. Allow me to interject that. I'm not going to read the entire chapter and, and, and make you suffer through East Tennessee and Hebrew like that. But allow me to do this for just a couple of verses. In the beginning, God created the heavens, vav, the earth. The earth was without form, vav, void, vav. Darkness was over the face of the deep, vav. The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, vav. God said, let there be light, vav, there was light. 
And you understand, it continues throughout the entirety of the chapter. And I say this, and I, and I, I make this one of the pillars of those framing parts of building the house for the very reason to refute such things, and we'll get into this more specifically later on, as a gap theory, or a day-age theory, or, you know, at the PCA, I believe the last time I checked, there are now four accepted views of creation that you can have to be able to continue to be ordained. And one of those is the day-age, one is the gap, one is the 624, and one is theistic evolution. They are now allowing that to be able to pass that part of the exam, if you will. And I offer a humble and yet bold correction that it's wrong. When you look at this passage, and I don't mean to be insulting, but it's, it's at the same time, this is the importance, and this is why we never need to stop training our seminarians to not just be able to use the tools of an original language, but to know it. You've got to know these things so that we don't repeat problems of the past. I had a very uh, wonderful conversation with a former professor of mine and for the masters, I won't mention this uh, name to, to protect the guilty, uh, <laughs> but uh, he was very instrumental in my life to just help understand some of these foundational things and then give the big picture. So he was my ethics professor, my master of divinity. And his big picture was, there are going to be differences. And yes, each denomination should hold to those differences by faith and with strength and with courage and boldness. But he said, Joshua, remember this also. There are hundreds of denominational voices who claim Christ. And they're, they're, they're pro-Christ. They want him to be glorified throughout all the earth. And he said, in the beginning... We look a lot like the church of the first century today, don't we? Where you have all of these sections and divisions of understanding. You look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, really what I call the first general assembly of the church. And you see that the main debate was should circumcision still be practiced? And so you see all of these progressions throughout. But it is so important that these, if there be differences, that they are based in the word of God, not just to claim a reference, but in true exegesis of that passage, in true interpretation of what it says, that should be our foundation for any of our doctrines. And so as we see in this, in this second uh, pillar or this, this framework of the house that we are building of a six 24 hour day view, of creation. It is the Vav consecutive that is throughout chapter 1. The third pillar, or the continuation of the building of this house in, uh, in the Word to defend the 624 hour debut, is the phrase that's found after each of the six days. And I want to explain in the fifth point, in the final point later on, why I don't believe it's after the seventh day. But it's after the first six days, and it's, it's, it's the sentence, or it's the phrase, and there was evening, and there was morning. The first day, the second day, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day, the sixth day. It is not after the seventh day. And I want to come back to that for, for a specific reason as the fifth and final point, or the roof of the house, the finishing of the uh, five points. But for here, uh, the Hebrew words there, so you have evening would be Erev, E-R-E-V. Again, this is East Tennessee in Hebrew. And then you have morning, Beker, B-E-K-E-R. Now, whether or not that Im immediately denoted two 12-hour periods of time, or 14 and 10, or 13 and 11, or do you fill in the blank? We know those two to equal a 24-hour period of time. And again, let me work my way backwards just so that we can see the steps that we hold with this view. So you have the evening and morning, which we understand because of the Vav consecutive, 
which we understand because the work week we know from Exodus 20 verses 8 through 11 is modeled after the creation week. And so we are able to then define here is evening and here is morning. Here are two periods of time that equal 24 hours. And this also shows the fact that there was no gap. There was no day age. There, there, there was no pause within the, uh, the cr creative work of our Heavenly Father for any reason. He, he, did, he certainly didn't need the rest. And when you look at the Sabbath, there was no need for it because he was tired. He simply rested. Uh, and so when we look at this, there is such an attempt over and over again within the Word to try to marry science and Scripture. Whether it's for the sake of numbers, popularity, politics, money, you fill in the blank. There is such a need and a desire that we would somehow try to, to bend and twist this infallible, inspired, inerrant, and propositional word to a culture that constantly changes their definitions. And I believe it's interesting when you look at the explanations of science that because we don't bend to their understandings, they throw the scriptures away completely. Not all, but most. And I would simply say that when you look at this and you look at how God simply spoke ex nihilo out of nothing, how he spoke that into being, all of it. And then you look at science and say, they would say, well, this tree uh, ages 14 million years old. My response to that may shock you. I say, praise the Lord. Now, wait a minute. You've just been pounding for an hour total on uh, how we believe in a young earth and six 24 hour day. What do you mean by that? Well, you have a timeless God who has spoken creation into being out of nothing. To him, what is 14 million years? What is 2.7 billion years? It's, in, it's not even infancy compared to infinity. Uh, now, how did they come about with carbon-14's formula? I'm not a scientist, but that has always been my go-to when I hear, well, what do you think about the age of this rock that's 200 million years old? Praise the Lord. He spoke it into being 200 million years old for him is nothing. Now, we know that this world has been here for about 7,500. <laughs> However, if it looks and appears, praise the Lord. And we understand that he is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. We also know his word is truth. And that is the pillar of which we say evening and morning. There was an evening and there was morning. And you see this phrase also with that, and it was so. It happened because I said it happened. It happened because I made it to happen. And it was so. The fourth pillar, and again, we're, we're working our way, we're, we're building the home, or we're uh, showing these pillars that this six 24-hour day view stands on. The fourth, we can then define the word yom. Yom is the uh, Hebrew word Y-O-M uh, for day. And so when you look at uh, Genesis chapter 1, you look at Exodus chapter 20, you look at Deuteronomy 5, where you see uh, the, the, the creation account, there are other passages. We know in this context, Yom is a 24-hour period of time that is made up by evening and morning, that is made up on the fact that uh, this, this is one complete thought of Moses showing his, his creative work within a week that is rooted in the fact that his word is truth. So you see how we're building these steps and you see how we're building these layers for this doctrine, this doctrine that is rooted in the word and by the word and for the glory of the one who has authored the word. And so we, we know in this passage 
that yom means a 24-hour period of time. Now, let me also speak to this. Are there other passages in the Old Testament where yom doesn't mean a 24-hour period of time? The answer is yes. The day of the Lord, for example. We know that to be, it, it could be a literal 24-hour day. It, it could be an age or an unknown period of time. Uh, there will come a day when the sons of, of man, so, so you see these, these different phrases uh, that could show in those contexts that it would be more than a 24 hour period of time. But in Genesis chapter one, Exodus 20, Deuteronomy five, I don't, I don't say this to keep beating a horse. I, I, I want us to nail this down in our hearts and our minds so that when we hear the onslaught of things that are against us saith the Lord, we then have that armor to be able in love and in grace and mercy to show them God's word is truth. And so we know this to be a 24 hour period of time. Now finally, in, uh, in I believe it begins verse, let's see, it's chapter two, which I love the fact that uh, it, it goes into chapter two for, for many, many reasons. Number one, it drives the day age theories and the gap theories nuts. <laughs> which I love that but I also love it because it, it takes the time to show beginning at verse number one of, of Genesis chapter 2 just, just allow me to read uh, the first three verses thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all of the host of them and on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done so God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation it repeats the phrase over and over again in those three verses and I love that Moses is emphasizing obviously through the behoovement of the Holy Spirit that God breathed work that God did through those who recorded the scriptures I want the reader of this passage to know that what I am saying is truth. This is the Old Testament way of saying, verily, verily, truly, truly, amen, amen. That's the original in, in the Greek. Truly, truly, I say to you, when, when, when you see phrases repeated over and over again uh, within the word of God, take time to, if I may say, take a selah. Take that, take that time to just meditate on, on the glory and the blessing that is within the Word of God. And I want to simply say this as the, as the fifth point as we came to. You'll notice after the end of verse 3 it doesn't say, and there was evening and there was morning the seventh day. It's not in there. And I believe when we look at this particular passage, and we see how in Exodus 20, we know that it was a 24-hour period of time. The Sabbath was because he says, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth to see and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. And he says in chapter 2, uh, verse uh, 1, 2, and 3, I'll just reference verse 3. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. We know it to be a 24-hour period of time. But I believe the reason it doesn't say, and there was evening and there was morning, is because it's a picture of the rest that we have to come with him forever in glory. And you see that, well, one day we will rest from our labors. We will rest from the work that we have done. And we will go to be with him forever, where there is no more night, where there is no more erev. And we see this argument also of the Sabbath. That if for some reason each of these days were an unknown period of time, whether it be millions of years or it be this unknown long period of time, I would suggest to you that if each were to be believed to be a million years or two million years or millions and millions or billions of years, we've yet to celebrate a Sabbath. And we know that's not true because 
all over the word. There are Sabbath feet, there, there are laws for the Sabbath. It was, uh, it was John in Revelation 1 who, knowing that Christ had been raised from the dead, as we'll celebrate the table of the Lord in just a little while, he records in, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, and on the Lord's day, I was caught up. We know that to be a 24-hour period of time. We under, That happened within the day. And so we see all of these arguments that are for the word of God to, to be that foundation of why we believe what we believe. And so when, when the world, and they're not going to probably ask you this specifically unless they've watched the sermon, they're, they're not going to look at you and say, Christian, what do you believe? They're going to poke and they're going to prod or they're going to say, you know, I was watching such and such channel, or I was reading such and such book, or I've been in class with such and such professor, and they say that the word is, or should not be the truth that we accept, the truth that we teach. Uh, and they won't say it that way. They'll, they'll be more cunning and sly. And it's our duty, whoever we come in contact with, when these conversations are, and even even when they don't, and you bring them up, and you say, you know, what do you believe about creation? You're armed and loaded now. I feel sorry for the people that you're going to talk to uh, because you understand these truths. It is the duty of the church. And I, I want to quote R.C. Sproul here. It is the constant duty of the church that we proclaim the gospel. We proclaim the truths that are within, thus saith the Lord, with every generation with the same boldness, the same clarity, and the same urgency that we have always done so for centuries. And it is our, it is our job, it is our ministry as the church to constantly be that beacon of hope to the world round about us. Let me please ask you, uh, as we bring this sermon to a close, just to simply turn to Judges, uh, chapter uh, 2 Judges chapter 2 and I want to read verses 4 through 10 as we examine uh, what uh, the people uh, of, of the Lord need to do uh, as their ministry as being a people of God and this is the constant generational call Judges chapter 2 beginning at verse, uh, excuse me, number 6, and I'll read through uh, verse 10. When Joshua dismissed the people, the people of Israel went each to his inheritance to take possession of the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 years. And they buried him within the boundaries of his inheritance in timnath Heres, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Gaash. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. Here's the verse. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord for the work that he had done for Israel. It is that calling of the church that we constantly go to the world round about us, that we tell them, we tell to all that God is love, don't we? Just to quote the hymn, we, we show them uh, the excellencies of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And we constantly are being that witness to them, as we read last week in Isaiah 55, his word will not return unto him empty. I tell you, that is one of the most powerful passages. When you're just trying to pour your heart out to somebody and you, you can't beat them over the head with a Nerf bat because that's just, that doesn't happen. But you want to, uh, or begin to pick up practices again, maybe with your own children, that you would stone disobedient children at the city gate. Maybe that would work. But we can't do these things. So we have to understand it is the Lord who will break hearts of stone and put hearts of flesh in their place. And we give him praise this morning for how 
he has called us out of darkness. The, the word ecclesia in the Greek is, is the word for church, and it literally means the called out ones, those who have been removed from the darkness into his marvelous light. And so as we come to the table of the Lord in just a few moments, we certainly prepare our hearts and our minds to receive uh, this this body which has been given for us uh, so that we may have fellowship with him. As the old, uh, or as the original language says, not so much eternal life, but life into the ages. It's certainly the same thing, but we see it more specifically. It is that zoe ionon, life forevermore, or life into the ages. And we give him praise this morning. And so we give him praise as the church that we belong to him. And we rest on his word, and we give him praise for his word this morning. Shall we pray? Father, take this word and apply it to our hands and our feet, our vocal cords, that as we speak to the world round about us, that firstly you would go before us and you would pave the way, that you would break hearts of stone and put hearts of flesh in their place, that Father, we know that you and you alone are the only one who can save us and the only one who saves your people from their sins. And so, Father, we ask that even now, uh, those whom we would come in contact with, that you would send your spirit to them, that, Father, we, we pray with, with humility and with boldness that those would not be able to rest until they run to you. And so, Father, we ask that as we continue in this hour of worship, that you would be pleased to bless, that, Father, uh, if I have preached anything in, in error, that you would correct it within my life, and that, Father, we would turn more to your word, uh, even now, as your people. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.